Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. That sounds great. Thank you, Brian, and nice to see everybody. Hope you're doing well today. I am very curious to hear your opinions about this topic. So I am going to do a brief talk on outlining the need, why we're even talking about this, the pros, the cons, and I'll finish up with my personal opinion and approach, which I hope will lead to some more discussion. So as you all know well, and I've reviewed with you several times, as well as others, I'm sure we've had a massive increase in bacterial STIs over the last several years, which is predominantly affecting men who have sex with men, but also heterosexual populations. And we see massive increases, most recently summarized here, in all three of the bacterial STDs. And we see morbidity associated with this, particularly in the form of congenital syphilis and the complications of neurosyphilis among patients, particularly MSM. So what tools do we have for STI prevention, right? Thinking now at the public health, the population level, as well as providers, we have counseling and education. So that's something that we do. From a standpoint of evidence, we actually don't have any great evidence that counseling and education makes any difference in preventing STI recurrence or STI prevention. Nonetheless, we do it, and it is an important thing to continue, of course, especially when we're seeing our individual patients. Condom promotion, there are people who use condoms. It's about a third of men who have sex with men coming into the STD clinic report using condoms at least some of the time with some partners. And I think we wanna make sure to support that and ideally to push up uh, the number of partners they're using it with or how often they're using it because condoms are, remain an effective prevention tool. Frequent testing and treatment really is the crux of what I think we're emphasizing right now for STI prevention particularly, again, speaking here for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. And then combination prevention. There's no one option, and it's really important for people, who, especially those who are at the highest risk of STDs, to think about what they're doing to prevent STDs. But we have had these tools for decades. There is nothing new here, right? So it's really important as we think about this new intervention of doxycycline prophylaxis, what's the alternative? Frankly, we don't have a good one until we get some vaccines, which are nowhere near. So doxycycline prophylaxis has been studied to date in two small randomized controlled trials, and it's been studied in two different forms. One of those is post-exposure prophylaxis. So this is just one dose of, a, one double dose of doxy within 24 hours after an unprotected sex event, uh, which can go up to 72 hours, similar to HIV PEP. Doxycycline pre-exposure prophylaxis, on the other hand, is just like HIV prep, something where it is 100 milligrams of doxy taken once a day, every day. So the largest study, which was still relatively small on this topic to date, was a randomized controlled trial that was done as a nested subtrial of the IPERGAY study. So IPERGAY was a large study of event-driven PrEP, which is the 211 PrEP for HIV, studied in France. And they randomized a subset of the men, 232, to either have doxycycline post exposure prophylaxis or usual care, with testing every two months in both groups. They instructed the men, these were all men in this trial, mostly middle aged, mostly white, gay men, um, who they instructed the men to take no more than six pills per week. And they ended up, as you can see there at the end, the median number was seven pills per month. So this form wasn't anything close to taking daily doxycycline. The intent of this was to prevent chlamydia and syphilis, not gonorrhea. This is something where we are in a somewhat different position in the US. So in Europe, the majority of gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea, is resistant to tetracyclines. In the US, it varies geographically, but it is closer to 20%. So conceivably, doxycycline could prevent gonorrhea in the US as well. And what they found was, first, very high STD rates. Uh, over an eight-month or 10-month period, there were cumulative probabilities of about 44% and 22% in the two groups, and a 47% relative reduction in STI. So it worked in this small and relatively short study. 
It was also studied as PrEP in what was intended to be a pilot study done in Los Angeles at the um, gay clinic there. Bob Bowen was the lead author. And they randomized HIV positive MSM, who had a history of syphilis ever, to either get doxycycline PrEP, daily doxycycline, or contingency management, which was cash payments for staying STI free during the study period. And they found a also statistically significant result with a 73% reduction in STIs. So as you can see in the doxy group, 11% had an STI during that period. And in the contingency management group, 31% had an STI. And we don't know what a usual care group would have looked like. Again, relatively small numbers, but appeared to be effective. And we do have experience with doxycycline prophylaxis outside of the STI setting, as most of you, I'm sure, know. So we do use doxycycline for prevention of malaria, leptospirosis, uh, and Lyme disease. And we use it for treatment of moderate to severe acne as well. And certainly, there are people who've been on doxycycline for long periods of time uh, for that indication. And it's been around for a while, so we certainly have a good understanding of the side effects. And the two main ones and most common ones are sun sensitivity, which is something that patients can be counseled about and can prevent uh, sunburn with sunscreen, and esophagitis, which is really a consequence when it happens of not drinking enough water and getting the pill stuck in the esophagus. So the key preventive, preventive mechanism for that is drinking enough water when you take the medication. So pretty safe and a lot of experience with doxycycline. Patients are interested in this, and I am very interested to see how this evolves over the coming years. Uh, when we were thinking about a study that we are now going to do, we just pulled patients who were on PrEP in our STD clinic. I, again, a very small number there, but out of 35 who we asked, told them about doxyprophylaxis, and then asked if they would be interested in taking it as post-exposure prophylaxis, 90% said yes. There was a survey done on Grindr, so a geospatial networking partner finding app, done in multiple cities in the US, you can see there. And both HIV negative and positive men expressed high levels of interest in doxycycline uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. And interestingly, African-American and Latino MSM in that survey were more likely to say that they were interested in this than non-Hispanic white MSM. And to some extent, we're going to have this discussion and we're going to keep studying this, but it's possible that the community is going to get ahead of us on this one, and that may already be happening. So we don't have a lot of data, but one, London, Public Health England, and BASH, the British Association, did actually take a stance against doxycycline prophylaxis. So they actually did specifically say it's not endorsed, we do not recommend using it. Shortly after those recommendations came out, a large sexual health clinic, 56 Dean Street, did a survey of their patients over a short period of time. And 8%, which is a small percent, but this is in the absence really of this being widely known and promoted, 8% already reported taking antibiotics to prevent STIs. And there's a screenshot you can see there of somebody just looking for a doctor who would prescribe doxycycline for STD prevention. So knowledge is increasing in the community, and perhaps use will increase as well. So the, those are really the pros so far, right? We think it works. We need more evidence. Uh, it, it is safe. We're going to talk more about that, but generally safe. And patients are interested in this. Antimicrobial resistance is, of course, the major downside. And I think it's important to just acknowledge right up front, we are not going to be able to predict this. So we need to study it, but we don't really know what's going to happen, right? In general, antibiotic use translates to antibiotic resistance. So if doxycycline is widely deployed for this purpose, we will almost certainly see resistance somewhere and in some form. In the STI pathogens, it's actually not as much of a concern. So gonorrhea, we have already given up on doxycycline use, despite what I said, uh, you know, even 20% resistance is enough for us not to use it, recommend using it in practice. In syphilis, there's been no doxycycline or tetracycline resistance ever reported to date. It could theoretically happen. Chlamydia, same thing. There has never been doxy or azithromycin true resistance in chlamydia trachomatis. It could absolutely happen. It happens in other strains of chlamydia, the pig chlamydia, but it hasn't yet happened in the human chlamydia. And then non-STI commensals. So certainly doxy is something we use for treatment of staph infections, and I don't know how this will affect it. And pneumococcus, there is actually some evidence that regular doxy use can drive uh, tetracycline resistance 
among pneumococcus. Commensal Neisseria in the throat, our enteric bacteria, this is something uh, that gets even harder to measure and study. I don't think we have a good understanding of what regular use of doxycycline would do to the broader microbiome. And then I think just importantly, we learn over and over again how humble we need to be about antimicrobial resistance. And I think there are just some unknown unknowns about what would happen. And although I made the case that doxycycline is safe, because it generally is, we still have to think about that and study that a little bit more. So first of all, although it's used chronically for acne, it's actually only recommended to use it for 12 to 16 weeks, not indefinitely. And it's not recommended to go beyond 24 weeks. There's some evidence that doxycycline use may be associated with weight gain. Uh, so chronic doxy use could be associated with weight gain. A lot of that is more from animal studies, so we don't really know. And benign intracranial hypertension, which causes headaches, is very rare. But again, if we use it more, we may see some, some of these things more. So I think the key question that we really don't know is what is the balance of risks and benefits here? And I think one thing that we really need to think carefully about is that as we're thinking of the benefits, uh, we need to really think about STD morbidity. So yes, it would be nice to see chlamydia case numbers go down or even stabilize. Uh, same thing with syphilis. But what really is the morbidity that we are trying to prevent? Chlamydia in particular, when we're talking about men who have sex with men, uh, rectal chlamydia, urethral chlamydia can cause symptoms, usually declares itself. Rectal chlamydia is not really a morbid infection, uh, and we can talk more about that, but it certainly is associated with other things, but it's not a morbid infection. Syphilis, yes, absolutely, can cause complicated neurosyphilis, otosyphilis, ocular syphilis, but that is pretty rare. So it's a careful balance, again, of the benefits and the risks. So where are we now? First, we clearly need more evidence for the effectiveness of doxycycline, PEP, or PrEP. Those two small studies were done in very specific populations. Uh, we have one study planned in Seattle and San Francisco that will look at this among both HIV negative and positive men. The HIV negative men will be on daily PrEP, which may make a difference in terms of how well people are able to adhere then to event-driven doxycycline, PEP. And there are also studies in Australia. Uh, France is doing another now larger blinded RCT and Canada as well. So I think when we think about this at the policy or routine use recommendations level, we are definitely not at a place where we have sufficient evidence to recommend routine use. To summarize what I've said so far about the pros and the cons, I think I summarized those earlier, so I'll leave those there. And I will say, I do think there are times, which are still very rare, when doxycycline PEP or PrEP could be indicated. And I think, and again, this is just my personal opinion, uh, that those cases, we need to have a conversation with the patient and think about really what we're trying to prevent. And it makes the most sense in a time-limited context. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off. Thank you.